Kicking off the list at number 10, KB55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KV55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number 8. Queen Nefertiti After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, East, not Earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number seven, Dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshipping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is... Let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, their, their poop, they would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there's a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as a scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time. But we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. 
So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together, and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything, and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars, and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is, after a while, it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly, if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly, it's the it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month, we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. Hi hieroglyphs are hard, man. I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out, though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh, but by the time of the pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever going to be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said, ah, to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramesses II and the Hittite king Hatsusili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation 
Revolution or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as Sel Queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that. Because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy and secondly he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So Egyptians like to play photoshop with their selfies the way we do now and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Ak as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believe their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut Space Knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smell. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool. And in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. 
All because of one man's love for his hippos. Number five, get to work. Also, speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prisoners are out on work duty, everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits, they're cleaning up all the garbage? Okay, that but ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot, hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot, like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting, too much for me. While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no no days off. No machines, no iron tools. I mean, it's all, oh man, that must be awful. Just the horror. <laughs> Just the worst. Number four, tarnished reputation. This one actually makes a lot of sense, really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubble gum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time. I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking in the tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number three, Fair Pharaoh. The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame this Alexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there. Trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I saved this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhinocolora, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles, was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. This was a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts, maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhino Cholera, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's, that's not good. Number one, in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest's verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky, if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. Okay guys, that's gonna wrap it up for me today. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe here at Bumblebee for more. Oh yes, more of the Chetty Meister, I like that. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good.
False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier. Remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Thus a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped out to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like 
that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members, and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following the their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam of bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. 
Nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange, I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron-based compounds as well as blue, green, white, and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. A little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue-eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. It kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. Number five, Xerxes the first. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees, Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history, but who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number four, Akhenaten. So this is gonna be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks, no. Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. 
Number 3. Khufu When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sort of don't know exactly how it was constructed. But this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number 2. Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number 1. Ramses II Alright, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Number 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's, that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk on my face, how do you know? There'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number 9. Prisoners While the promise of losing a limb the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They do it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that should be canceled them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well. Who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ah, oh boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before. Well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? 
Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. It didn't. Number six, Bloodhounds and Baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? Yes, that's right. There's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby. Uh-oh. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. 
that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar, and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title Heretic King and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea, he just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite, instead the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. He was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of 
but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces, and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge, and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now, I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way, and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally. Believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer, may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even dye job. Number four in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck the Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through master. Osiris, another god who eventually came along, became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had sex with his dead body. Ra also had sex with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now, just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So there was an issue with necrophilia towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for two, three days before passing them to the embalmers, so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean, they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, necrophilia and bombers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of culture practices, to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of pussy. Number three, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair eye rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians, and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something 
are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their contraceptives in point six, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease, and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick, and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating, and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records of sex changes, so this really was an outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. Irregardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number one. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6,600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's ejection. Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remains. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also mass into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had, well, finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come, pun intended. Number 10. Gold tongues. 140 miles south of Cairo is El Banasa. Archaeologists just found two sealed tombs containing the remains of a mystery man and a mystery woman, and an array of clues, and of course, treasures. The sealed tomb and sarcophagi, made of limestone, included scarab amulets, four canopic mummy jars, and more than 400 pieces of pottery and funerary figurines. Yeah, like little guys. The mummy's face was also so well preserved with a perfectly shiny golden tongue still inside his mouth. Ooh, ouch. They just like dip that in or they cut that off and kind of replace it. How's that work? Guy's gonna have a hard time with his L's. The team stumbled upon three golden tongues actually, and archaeologists working in the Alexandria also discovered gold tongue mummies dating to about 2,000 years ago. Talk about an expensive sentence, huh? Number nine, ginger. As always, if you like what we do here on Bumblebee, throw us a like button, why don't you? Or comment down below. Which one of these creep you out the most? The golden tongues? Dude. It's already got me. The Ghiblian pre-dynastic mummies are six naturally mummified bodies dating to approximately 3400 BCE, or from the late pre-dynastic period of ancient Egypt. Since 1901, the first body excavated has remained on display in the British Museum. The body, of course, was originally nicknamed Ginger due to its very well-preserved, healthy, shiny red hair. This nickname is no longer officially used, of course, because these are people we're talking about here. After the Human Tissue Act of 2004, the British Museum developed policies for proper treatment of human remains, and no longer used nicknames. Ah, 
Yeah, that would have been nice, wouldn't it? Just finding bones making jokes. Ah, yes, look, Limbs McGee. <laughs> I'll, I'll write that down. I'll write that down in here as the official. These six were excavated at the end of the 19th century by Wallace Budge and are the first complete, fully intact pre-dynastic bodies ever discovered to this day. Spooky. Number eight. King Tut. We can't just blow by this list without the scariest event of all. The tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings, led by Egyptologist Howard Carter. Tut's tomb was hidden by debris, luckily, therefore it never got looted throughout the centuries. More than 5,000 objects were found, including the infamous King Tut himself. Egypt, now part of the British rule, gave a feeling of national pride back then, strengthening pharaonism and gluing Egypt's ties to this now ancient world. The publicity surrounding the excavation intensified when one of the founders actually died of an infection, giving rise to the infamous cursed tomb. But then a couple of other discoverers just started dropping dead and everyone was like, oh yeah, yeah, so that's what cursed means, huh? It says, do not open right here. I see that now, gotcha. Number seven, John Wilkes Booth. Okay, so mummies are usually tied with Egyptian ritual and historical burial purposes, but it wasn't just them though. It's pretty common to preserve a body. John Wilkes Booth was famous for a couple of things. First off, he was one of the world's greatest actors, a true thespian, and of course, a prolific American presidential assassin. Yeah, he shot Lincoln, so. Apparently, he escaped the manhunt, which then apparently toured the US as a mummified version of himself. Wait, what? In 1903, a drifter named David E. George locked himself in a hotel, taking his own life by ingesting a lethal amount of arsenic. According to the news report, George made a confession. I am not David E. George. I am the one who killed the best man that ever lived. I am John Wilkes Booth. The embalmed body was soon fought over and beginning in 1937 and continuing all the way into the 1950s, the mummy was part of Jay Gould's million dollar circus. Yeah, traveling with elephants, acrobats, and high dive dog acts all around the world. According to a PBS report, the mummy itself was actually last seen in the 1970s and maybe in the hands of a private collector. Dude, People are sick. They'll buy and sell literally anything for money and clout. Like, I don't get it, dude. Just like buy and sell Pokemon cards or something, you know? Number six, Nikostratos. A large unknown Greco-Roman tomb was just found this year and excavated in Aswan in South Egypt. An Egyptian-Italian mission led by Patrizia Piacentini, professor of Egyptology and archeology span at the University of Milan. What makes this discovery so cool is the mummies that were discovered. This massive Romanized tomb located in the Aga Khan mausoleum found archeological treasures including offering tables, stone panels littered in hieroglyphics, and one large beautiful copper necklace engraved in Greek scripture with the name Nicostratus on it. The room is overlooked by four burial chambers dug deep into the rock where a beautiful terracotta sarcophagus lay. The architecture alone is puzzling, let alone these mysterious high order young adults that were mummified here. Early studies have indicated so far that the grave includes bodies from more than one family, so the mystery question, who was this Nicostratus? Who was he? And who were these unrelated followers that followed him? Number five, Lord Nefertiru. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member, Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to stronghold of Ra. 
Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths, and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three. Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, King Tut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable x-ray fluorescence spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade Blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps, and both have stone serpents. The vault arches are also strikingly similar, and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below all your thoughts. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion, so how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshephut, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. 
perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. That's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered, a totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with the little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold Gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After the radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasure, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns, symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and right rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies, meaning with every step he was crushing the enemies of Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda understandable when you have 102 of them with about nine women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archeologists announced in 1820, they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses and that 52 or so of his sons happened be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 60 
two rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens. But their kids, no. If it turns out the only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not. So they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No. Oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer, Didoris Siculus, even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the first dynasty is inscribed is bust to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umm al-Kab, and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and distress for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Umm al-Kab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, believe my eyes. Even though it may be a lie. Who knows? I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in his DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass blind. Pharaohs vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells pharaohs all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. 
okay. Well, Pharaoh isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I wanna spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try, only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer, so imagine. But somehow Pharaoh finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married, and the one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say, yeah, magic pees did this. His sight is back, and he asks for the hand of the magic pee wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while, her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyesight, and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, <laughs> fetish. We got a <laughs> fetish here. Sammy <laughs> Lacker, <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine. Baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw in and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit, they train them to make beer, and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, it depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. 
She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheet, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it. The baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying. It's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go. But in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. Tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. 
You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. All right, so not to toot my own horn, but I think we've got a lineup here most people won't recognize. So let's start with the recognizable King Tut conspiracy. Anything around King Tut is a mystery since the tomb's discovery in 1922. The curse, his age, the disabilities, and most importantly, what the hell happened to the kid? And I'm allowed to call him a kid. I'm older than him, at least in alive years. The reason we can't tell is because there's a couple options for what happened to him. King King Tut had malaria and suffered from some disabilities physically due to, well, mom and dad are also auntie and uncle, you know? He had a club foot, a G-way spine, a cleft palate, so he was always destined to die at a young age, unfortunately. But when he died at 19 in 1323 BC, it wasn't of any disability. His mummy shows that he had a fractured and blood clotted skull, which made people believe he was stabbed or conked on the back of the head. But it was also believed that his head was damaged while his body was being embalmed. But he also broke his knee shortly before he died, in a way that implies he could have been killed in a chariot accident. And then newer CT analysis of scans in 2003 show that Tut was embalmed without his heart and interior chest wall, and that confirms that these structures couldn't have been removed by either tomb robbers or the discoverer Howard Carter. It happened before mummification. Thus now it's suggested that a crushing injury to the chest was cause of death. The extensive crushing and tearing of a hippopotamus bite, that is. So who knows what happened to Tut? Was it a coup, a chariot, a hippo? For now, it remains unsolved. And like Tut, his wife remains a mystery. So up next is what happened to Ai and Akinsenamun. The coup theory for Tut's death revolved around his elderly chief advisor and successor Ai, who is depicted in even Tut's burial chamber, and decided since Tut didn't have kids, he should seize the crown himself. But Tut had a wife, and the kings of Egypt could be a man or a woman. So when Tut died, his wife Anne was terrified of the corrupt priests and the rising power of General Horamab, also of being forced to marry a servant such as Ai. So she writes to the king of the Hittites and offers herself and the throne of Egypt to one of his sons. Prince Zanzananza sets out for Egypt, but is killed when he arrives because Hormab knew An's plan. So who did An have to marry? A, the master of horses and thieves, exactly what she had dreaded, and now a commoner's on the throne. By the way, some believe that I was the father of Queen Nefertiti, and Nefertiti was An's mother. So, do the math. Together, they assume the throne before Tut was even in the ground. I dies in 1319, but Anne vanished from the face of the earth around 1316 to be replaced with his new wife, Tay. History doesn't know where Anne went. Did A force her to marry him, thus legitimizing his claim to the throne, only to kill her? Could she have also been victim of the known serial killer, Horambe? Following the demise of Tut and I, Horambe did become pharaoh, and while he was, he mysteriously had the names of Akhenaten, Tut, and I removed from the royal list of pharaohs, which suggests he had a personal reason for eradicating those rulers. He also struck records of Anne, but not the second wife, Tay. There's been no discovery regarding Anne's death or burial to date, and genuinely no one knows what happened to her. I've made mention of this noble battle before, so let's talk about how the Hippo King died. When the mummy of King Sekinenre Tal II was removed from his gift wrap in 1886, he immediately stood out from the other pharaohs discovered alongside him. His skull looks like someone had literally pointed a sandblaster in its mouth, and the hands were also all mangled. Also, he showed signs of decay pre-mummification, which was weird for Egyptians. But no surviving records shed light on how he met his grisly end. So it was time to play operation and find out some important bits. And they did. The angles of impacts and a combination of his skulls and Egyptian blades match the shape of sex wounds all and only to his head. So they CT the skull in 2021 and previously historically reported injuries are all there, but an additional injury on the right lateral side of the skull that had been concealed by the embalmers beneath the layers and material is finally depicted. But if this was on the battlefield, why were the king 
Daniel's hands tied. Also, why was he attacked by multiple assailants from above while kneeling, which was the position he died in? Hmm. The researchers suggest that Sek was most likely captured in battle against Hykosos and then bludgeoned in a ceremonial execution while his hands were bound behind his back, either on the battlefields or in a dungeon or something. They suggest he died as a result of fighting to liberate his kingdom, also the hippo pool, and rather in a scandalous way such as a palace conspiracy. So while we may have the why and the how of Sek's death, but we don't really have the who, the what, and the where. So, Yo guys, we got some news, a new mummy just dropped. Hot off the press of 2014, we got a new lineup for the most debaucherous royals around. Said tomb is about 3,600 years old and rests 300 miles from Cairo. And guys, it's the first evidence of the Abdus dynasty that's apparently thrived 36,000 years ago during ancient Egypt's second intermediate period. A necropolis of a lost dynasty that has only been hypothesized to exist until now. Sekembe ruled until around 1650 BC between the Middle Kingdoms end and the New Kingdom start and was found in a 60 ton sarcophagus chamber just absolutely ripped apart by grave robbers and left scattered, undisturbed for a millennia. So how did a whole ass dynasty just go up and missing for 3600 years? And how does a buried pharaoh go undiscovered? for so long. Ancient Egyptians were committed recyclers. Sekembe's giant quartzite sarcophagus chamber came from a royal tomb built originally for a pharaoh called Sobateke, who lived around 150 years before him. Why look where you've already looked, you know? Now for the mysterious death. Homeboy was cut up. A total of 18 wounds. Three major blows to his skull have the distinctive scythe and curve of battle axes used during Egyptian's second intermediate period. This means like Sek, we're looking at a battlefield, ambush, or ceremonial execution and we have no idea where it occurred or how. Possibly the king died in a battle against the Hykosos king who at that time ruled the northern Egypt from their capital of Averius, or in struggles against enemies of south of Egypt. Alternatively, Sekembe might have also had political opponents, possibly kings based at Thebes, who notorious hated his ass. It had to come up at some point, so let's find out what's up with Cleo. After Roman forces crushed the Egyptian army in the Battle of Atticum, Antony and Cleopatra retreated to Alexandria, where they watched their former allies and supporters defect to Octavian's side and had a two-story mausoleum quickly constructed on Cleo's palace grounds. Hearing a false report that she had died, Antony jumps the gun a little and stabbed himself on the spot with his own sword. His men carried him to Cleopatra and he died in her arms looking like a moron. Meanwhile, according to Plutarch, a member of Octavian's staff secretly warns Cleopatra a month later that Octavian's taken her to Rome with him. Hell no, I won't go, Cleopatra shuts herself away in the mausoleum with two maid servants, Iris and Charmion, and they sent a note to Octavian saying, suck it, and by the way, bury me with Antony. Octavian's men rush to the mausoleum, bust the door down, find an RA dead Cleo and maids. This is the most repeated theory of Cleo's death, but it's riddled with holes. Apparently, cobra venom did her in. But cobras were too big to be smuggled in, and Venom's actually a really slow death, making it hard to believe the snake was able to kill Cleo and her two maids in the short time it took for Octavian to receive her note and get there. If she did poison herself, there was no way it was snake venom. With no known eyewitnesses to and no primary written records and accounts of Cleopatra's death, pretty much all we know comes from one man, Octavian, who is the main suspect if we look at it as a killing. He certainly had a motive to want Cleopatra dead, as her lineage posed a potential threat to the dominance in Egypt. Looks shady that the second she's dead, too, he directs his guards to hunt down her teenage son. Then Octavian made Egypt a province with himself as emperor. He changed his name to shed the negative image his Octavian title now carried after being suspected of killing everyone's favorite queen. Last but not least, Octavian slash Augustus ensured his version of Cleopatra and her death, snake bite and all, would be written the same in every single one of his subsequent memoirs, so that one very specific version of the story could live on for centuries to come. Because that's not suspicious. At all. Number five, tattoos. Okay, so who was the first? We see them everywhere. I don't have any myself, but every which way you look, somebody's tatted head to toe. So who was the first one? Well, a mummy known as the Gablian Man A pushes evidence back about a thousand years. The oldest tattoos were once thought to belong to a South American Chinchoro mummy who had a mustache tattooed onto his face. It was initially thought that he was the oldest specimen of ink. Then an ancient princess was found in Siberia. She holds one of the most well-preserved tattoos ever found on a body. Princess that's Ukok, a Scythian ruler who sadly died of breast cancer around 3,000 years ago. Her body was inked up so heavily and she was buried next to six horses, indicating that she was of high, high royalty. But in 1991, the oldest mummy ever found still holds the Guinness World Record for the oldest tats. Like, 
5,000 years old. Otzi the Iceman reps 61 tattoos over his entire body, mostly lines that researchers think was either medicinal or therapeutic. Several needles were tied together and the skin was pricked stick and poke style with ink made from wood smoke and milk. Mix them together, rub them all over the wounds and voila, Travis Barker. Number four, the Lady of Cow. Speaking of being tatted head to toe for reasons we're still unsure of, the Lady of Cow. She was discovered in 2006 by a team of Peruvian archeologists in the El Brujo archeological complex in Northern Peru led by Regulo Franco Jordan, one of the National Cultural Institute of Peru. The mummy, which is heavily tattooed head to toe and wrapped in many layers of cloth, was found with a ton of ceremonial items, pottery, weapons, and jewelry. The remains of a second young woman were found as well, and researchers think it could have been a sacrifice, signifying this woman was a ruler of many. Modern autopsy reveals that they were in their mid-20s and died of complications due to pregnancy. They think she died somewhere around 450 BCE, and until they found her, researchers were almost certain that only men held high standing in their culture and power, and that women of this status should never have existed. Well, rewrite them, boys, because Beyonce said it. Who run the world? Girls. Boom, right there. Evidence, sacrifice, tattoos, come on. Number three, killer crocs. In 1899, archaeologists funded by the University of California benefactor Phoebe A. Hurst found hundreds of crocodile mummies on an expedition to northern Egypt. 19 mummified crocodiles are part of the Egyptian collection at the Phoebe A. Hurst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. These things were a constant threat to ancient Egyptians, and there were a lot of them. Some tomb walls are even decorated head to toe with scenes that show herdsmen performing magical spells to ward off crocodiles before they cross the Nile on wooden boats. It was such a big problem every August when the Nile would flood that there were croc priests who would spend all day mummifying and offering them to the gods. Apparently the Dutch National Museum of Antiques unwrapped and scanned a 3,000 year old croc mummy which were actually 50 little crocodiles positioned in a way to make it look like a giant croc. Like a croc within a croc. And not just them too. The cat-faced goddess Bastet would receive mummified cats while baboons were offered to Thoth, the god of wisdom. Animal mummification was so popular that it became a thriving industry. In one catacomb complex, Egyptologists think there could be as many as 70 million mummified animals crammed into like 30 small rooms. Different times, man, different times. Number two, Chinchoro mummies. On the sandy dunes of the Atacama Desert, the Chilean port city of Arica, bordering Peru, was home to the Chinchoro people. In July, the United Nations Cultural Organization, UNESCO, added hundreds of well-preserved mummies to its world heritage list. The Chinchoro mummies. First documented in 1917 by German archeologist Max Yule, who had found some of the preserved bodies actually on a beach. Radiocarbon dating eventually showed that the mummies were more than 7,000 years old, more than two millennia older than the more widely known Egyptian mummies. The earliest one, the Achaman, dates to 7020 BCE. They discovered their process of three stages. The black technique was to take the deceased person's body apart, limb by limb, treating it and then reassembling it all in like a Mr. Potato Head style. Then, the red technique, which made incisions above the shoulders to remove all internal organs and dry the body out. And finally, the mud coat. Basically, taking the body in a mixture of clay and gypsum in a last coat seal. Then they'd wrap you up. And using sticks to mold and hold a cast of a person's shape, this process was, well, this. Researchers think that Egyptians were like, oh, that's how you do it. I see what the, okay, perfect. I'm just gonna go over there and do that. And number one, Saqqara mummies. In 2019, just 20 miles south of Cairo on the Nile's west bank, there lays a field mixed of sand and earth that make up the ancient site of Saqqara. It's the oldest building known to humans. Like old, old. Older than the three pyramids. And with that comes a new archeological discovery. This year, archeologists just discovered the largest loot of ancient Egypt ever. Better than Tut's tomb, 150 bronze statues, 250 coffins with mummies in them that date back 3,000 years. Saqqara is Egypt's richest archeological site. Home to the 4,700 year old Step Pyramid, Egypt's oldest, the site was used as a burial ground. Geophysical surveys have revealed the remains of numerous temples buried under the sand in which we have discovered only a quarter of the actual site. Millions of animal mummies like dogs, cats, cobras, and crocs, even two lion cubs were found mummified. The work site is 500 yards long and the archeologists working there have only carried out the first 100 yards of digging. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not gonna lie. I can't wait to see like what next year holds. 
Like, get some more bulldozers going, you know? Sakara, Gobekli Tepe, Peru. More scans, more scans. So interesting, but also very terrifying. Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half-brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1470, BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1,500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass, honestly. Just do your thing, work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl, you got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be 
revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. They were good and then they were great and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amen one He's the great great granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great granddaddy Amen the second, who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is granddaddy Amen. Amen the third, who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish and his building projects are legendary. And then there's disastrous daddy Akhenaten or Amen the fourth. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that it Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armania and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket, we have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahad and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Atan though, Akmahan's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after a ton. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year. Whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four part family tree. First, great granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. World. Apparently we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566 and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise, and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. De Freya's pyramid was quarried for its stone and as such there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile the underson Khafri succeeded the short lived Radifi and married his sister and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, one of the three great pyramids of Giza and also best known for the sphinx which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses the first gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friend and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti I, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramses II, son of Seti I, was able to finish his father's
father's work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses II went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet and a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies! People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Platonomies started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Platonomy killed his mother who had killed her husband who was having a love affair with her mother and then married his sister Aronso III who was then later killed after Platonomy IV died. Platonomy XII annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice IV, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice IV ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled who wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Platonomy XII. Platonomy IV 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmose line. Granddaddy Thutmose the first became king after Amenhotep died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarchs generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Thutmose II as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish Hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful Hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tut II, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thut II died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmose III, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt, but at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile upsurge. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook-wielding king with the broad, bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long, flowing hair and feminine features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real in ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient 
Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number nine is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a that's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear them. Baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that shit on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new found appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases, and in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds start to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some truly hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. Okay, men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. Number five, breaks. Yeah, I've never broken anything and I don't plan to. It sounds like the worst thing. I see it on Reddit and I'm like, ooh. But living in ancient Egypt, you're gonna break a bone or dislocate something sometime. But back then, it's not like you can just head over to the emergency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies, a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No. So how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment
treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way. No, this way, hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on. Go to the doctors, hit that thumbs up. There we go, the more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes, and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember, as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery. And that is the postmortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed. Like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spread, you know, hey, Nubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. you love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call, he loves that one, big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or a jealous someone when watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris' brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris' measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge. He jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers wanna show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshiped scarabs. They worshiped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. And no, the sun wasn't a big ball of poop. It was just a big ball of life. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. 
He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestor since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone, pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number 8. Khufu's Ship when pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop. Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about this stuff. That's not a joke. I, I seriously do. But you know what? I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number six, construction manifest. You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm hmm The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. And like mother, like son, let's talk about the death of Caesarian. Because in 48 BC, Egyptian leader Cleopatra one day has an idea. Nude, she gets wrapped up in a carpet and her servant FedExes her over to the Roman leader Caesar's crib, where he unfurls the carpet and bam, smoking hot young naked chick. Thinking like the CEO of Hooters restaurants worked like a charm, especially since dirty old Caesar is like 30 years older than her at the time. Their unionizing caused a lot of crap politically, but it also resulted in Caesarian, the pair's only child. He was born in June of 47 BC and only returned to Egypt once Daddy Caesar had been 
caffeinated. But Mama Cleo has big goals. She wants Rome, baby. So she whips her clothes off and tosses herself at Mark Antony, the Caesar successor. He and Cleo establish a union, and apparently she was so good at unioning, he gave her a literal dominion over the massive empire, and Caesarian appointed the king of kings. Ladies, always remember, this works. But as mentioned, August of year 30 rolls around, and Mark Antony takes his life and died in Cleopatra's arms. Cleopatra following suit. Plutarch wrote that Caesarian had been sent to India, but also that he was lured back under false promises. Rawdon, a tutor, persuaded him to go back on the ground that Octavian invited him to take the kingdom of Egypt. Kid sadly falls for it, goes back, and his boat touches shore and the Romans descended upon him. Octavian is supposed to have had the pharaoh Caesarian executed in Alexandria following the advice of Arius Didymus, who said too many Caesars is not good. Good homer pun, dude. And yet the exact circumstances of his death and location of his body are not documented. His body has never been found and historians don't know how he died. They don't know where even. They don't know if he was captured and taken to the palace. Maybe there he bartered for his life and was exiled elsewhere, growing up and dying without notoriety. We have no idea. Taking a stroll one minute, dead the next. Poor old Archbishop. All right, so it's a little less ancient, but still pretty far back, and it's still unsolved. So, born in 1893 in the district of Matai, Egypt, Theophilius was taught Copic language and Orthodox doctrine from the womb. That's how he ended up being a tonsured reader in 1902. That's someone who read religious texts out loud for folks, since most people were literate. He starts as a monk in a monastery of St. Anthony the Great in 1910, given the mosaic name Monk Peter of St. Anthony. He was then ordained to the priesthood in 1915. Then Theophilius gets another promotion and another. From 1921 to 31, this guy's just hustling through the religious ranks, even being appointed abbot of monastery and being nominated for the Pope on two occasions. He loses out but nails the title of Metropolitan of Jerusalem and Archbishop of All Palestine, Philadelphia of Jordan, and All Near East. That's a big one. In 1935, as Metropolitan of Jerusalem, he continued the works and renovations and constructions of the church properties in the Holy Land, just doing a lot of good for his people and community, as all this preamble tells you. But then Monday, October 1st of 1945, Theophilius was popped while walking from the monastery of St. Anthony the Great in the Eastern Desert to the nearby village of Bush. No enemies, no quarrels, angry parishioners. The circumstances and reasons for the killing are unclear, and the perpetrator was never identified. This was also more of an era of knives and bludgeoning, so finding someone who had the right weapon for a bullet wasn't that hard, yet no one had ever been found. Now we're gonna do the opposite and go insanely far back in history. I'm talking pre-dynastic death. They're called the Gabaline Mummies, and there are six in total, all naturally mummified and dating back to approximately 3400 BC, the late pre-dynastic period. This is the first ever complete bodies found from that period, and they were all excavated at the end of the 19th century. In this period, bodies were usually buried naked and sometimes loosely wrapped. When the bodies covered in warm sand, the environmental conditions evaporate or drains the water of the body quickly, and the corpse is naturally dried and preserved. It's believed this traditional method was the source for the original Egyptian belief in after-death survival and started the tradition of leaving food and implements for an afterlife. In 2012, they make a unique discovery. A CAD scan of one of the mummified bodies showed that it was a man, aged about 18 to 20 at the time, and hella buff, but also hella killed by someone else. A puncture under his left shoulder blade was made with such force it shattered a rib and punctured his lung. It was believed that the injury was caused by a copper blade or flint knife at least 12 centimeters in length and 2 centimeters wide. The man had been taken by surprise as the attack had no defensive wounds. Naturally, the British government stole these mummies as usual and they remain in their possession and collection today. But don't worry, the priceless artifacts also found at the graves weren't stolen by the British Museum, just by the British archaeologists and excavators themselves. Now those pieces remain lost forever and since 1901, the first body excavated remained disrespectfully on display in the British Museum. Don't know why they call it that when there isn't a single British item in there. This is an and we are still uncovering the secrets of how Ramesses towed the line. I love my puns. This was a very unstable chapter of Egypt's history. The endless war with the sea people draining the treasury, the climate change, political unrest, all the good stuff that leads to a high level conspiracy in 1155 BC. The courtiers, military, sorcerers, harem, hell even his wife Tia was in on this. And sure, while the killers who were wielding the weapons will probably never be identified, an ancient document titled the Judicial Papyrus of Turin D details the plot to kill Ramesses III, and that his secondary wife Tia and her son Pentaware conspired with each other against the pharaoh, who had selected an heir from a more senior wife. Alright, so the death itself. 2012 is when a CT scan finally reveals to us how Ramesses died. He had had his throat slit so viciously it severed esophagus and trachea, an instant death. But they also found evidence he was killed by multiple assailants. Ramesses had one of his big toes hacked off, and the wound never had time to heal, meaning it likely happened at the same time as a 
his throat was cut. The shape of the cuts also indicate a different weapon used than the one of the cut of the throat, as does the fact his pills are broken. The likelihood is, is there is a assailant with an axe in the front and one coming from behind with a dagger. Then we learn that the embalmers attempted to hide Ramesses' wounds, performing a little post-mortem cosmetic surgery. They fashioned a fake toe out of linen and covered it with heavy layers of resin, thus why the researchers in the 19th century couldn't get the linens off his feet, and the CT scan revealed to researchers why. Since his slaying was so notable, the ancient police and their baboons investigating the death had rounded up just about everyone they could find. Butlers, servants, nobles, and wives. They had plenty of chances to overhear the conspiracy the courts ruled, and their failure to report it made them criminals. As punishment, their ears were cut off, since because as far as the courts were concerned, they weren't making good use of them anyway. The one I'd be most excited to share, since nobody is going to know who I'm talking about, the Takabutis slaying. Egyptian women shaved their heads in order to don wigs. It was better for their scalps under the hot sun, and it prevented diseases and lice. That's what made Takabuti an anomaly. She had her own hair, and it was peach in color. This suggests her hair was of great importance to her, and a cross section of its DNA revealed something unexpected. Takabuti was somehow African, European, and Asian. How? Mitochondrial DNA allowed for testing to show she's of an ethnicity we don't have anymore. A rare H4A1 halpo group. This halpo group has never been found in ancient Egypt before, so let me repeat that. She's a literal ethnic race of human we don't have anymore, and the first known of their kind in Egypt. Mystery number one down. So how did this lovely lady die? It takes decades to determine that she'd been stabbed from behind, but the weapon was mistakenly thought as a knife at first. Recent discoveries now say a military axe was probably thrown at her from behind as she was running from her assailant. Naturally, the injuries from a flying axe hitting you are absolutely brutal, and her death was likely immediate. While the killers believed to be an Assyrian soldier, Takabuti might have faced betrayal at the hands of one of her own people. Egyptian military and their peoples used the same axe as the Assyrians. Ancient Egyptians believed that the soul needed a body to reawaken, thus explained the effort to put in to cover Takabuti's wounds with as much resin and linens as possible. The scientists who reconstructed her face noticed its expression was overcast with a shadow of sadness, a reflection of emotion and felt in her last moments. Though Takabuti's death was a nightmare, the years hypothesizing and investigating went into finding out everything about her possible. It wasn't just about how she died. They were about how she lived. And finally, people know this woman even lived. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian. And it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually, the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much, and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and, by extension, the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number nine is a famous husband. Ramses the second. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah, blah. He's the son of Seti the first, and Ramses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu 
Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to show also established mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just started stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Number five original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet or finished at least. So instead they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close, let's just give me a shovel, I'll get in there, I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything, I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. 
Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming Pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. Well, not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number nine, 40 year old's worst nightmare. Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that you ain't as limber as you used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was gonna say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something, but no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the peace deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number eight, ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number seven, Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is gonna be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just, sort of mash it up there and just, well then they drain the contents from the nose, which, that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt in the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers 
which is a cat, it'd be mummified because, well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. Lahayim, it's done. There it is. That, that, that's it. It's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to make you veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Number five. Space Knight. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out, whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite, so that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed, so we have really no idea who's in KB-55, or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, but in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked in seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, 
they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past, that's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows, be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible. It's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards, and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo, and then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer. They won't stomp you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. At number 10, brotherly love. There were some weird things happening between the gods in Egyptian mythology, as we will come to learn through this video. To get us started on this journey through the strangest of stories, let's talk about some serious closeness between the gods Osiris and Isis. These two gods were husband and wife, but they were also brother and sister. Yeah, it's weird, but they were gods, so I guess it was fine. These two ruled Egypt until their other brother, Set, killed Osiris. When her husband died, Isis went on a search to find Osiris' body because she just really wanted to have a child with him and just wasn't gonna let pesky old death get in her way. When she found Osiris' remains, she was able to resurrect him for long enough for them to conceive a child. However, that process was a little difficult because she wasn't able to get the most important part of him for that because a fish had apparently eaten his member. Again, Isis was a very resilient woman, and quite crafty too because she just crafted him a new device, if you will, and they went on to produce a son, Horus, who would later become the new king of Egypt. This story is a little weird, don't get me wrong, but it's also a story of perseverance, I guess, so maybe it's not all bad. Hi number nine, trophies. I know a lot of people like to save little mementos and souvenirs from things that meant a lot to them in life. People save movie stubs from their first date with someone, little objects from their childhoods, and a whole collection of other things saved from different points of their lives. There was an Egyptian god who sort of did the same thing, but a little creepier. Well, actually it was a lot creepier. The god Anubis was the god of mummification, and I guess you could say that he just really liked his job. He was part of the embalming process for some big names like Osiris. See, tying it back to the previous story when the god Set killed his brother Osiris, he got pretty buddy buddy with Anubis because he offered Osiris' organs to the god of mummification. But not for Anubis since he was known to collect pieces of the remains of people that he had embalmed. He had a thing for limbs and other remains, I guess. It was a weird collection to have, that's for sure, but for the god of mummification, it almost seems fitting. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things that Egyptian gods did in their mythology, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, the last snack. For the Egyptians, a person's burial and their soul's final journey was a very big deal. We are probably all familiar with the mummification practices of the ancient Egyptians and all that, but what comes after was also pretty interesting. When someone died, it was believed that their soul would then move on to be judged. The soul would leave their body and go to the underworld, searching for the Hall of Truth. Once they found it, they would then be judged on who they were in their life, and if they passed the test, then they got to go to paradise. But if they failed, then they became a nice little snack for the goddess Emmet. Emmet was known as a demon goddess and dubbed the Devourer of Amenti. When the deceased was tested and their heart was weighed against a feather, if they failed that test, then Emmet would eat the person's essence and they would vanish for eternity. Obviously, you wouldn't want that to happen, so I guess this was just an incentive for Egyptians to live life as a good person. At number seven, down the Nile. Now, I know that I've mentioned the story of Set and Osiris a couple times now, but their story is just so messed up and weird that I have to keep including the best parts of it. Anyways, we all know that Set overthrew his brother Osiris as a king of Egypt and did so by killing him, but let's talk about exactly how that happened. 
Set was a really jealous guy and he resented his brother for being king, so he devised a plan to trick his brother into a coffin. Set had a coffin designed exactly for Osiris' measurements and while at a party, Set challenged Osiris to get in it as he promised that he would give the coffin as a gift to anyone who could fit inside it. So yeah, it was rigged from the start. So Osiris gets inside and obviously it was a perfect fit. What he didn't know though was that this was where he would remain forever because Set sealed his brother in the coffin and sent it down the Nile River. After that, Osiris' wife slash sister Isis went to go find him and blah blah blah, we already know what happens next. At number 6, Lady of Plagues. Guys, if you haven't already clued in, we're still in a panorama. A panzerati. A pandemic. It seems like it'll never end, and after learning about the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet, I think I know why we're all going through this. It's because someone pissed her off big time. Sekhmet was known as the Lady of Terror, and if you don't get a good sense as to who she was just by her name, just you wait. This goddess had the ability to spread pestilence and plague against anyone who remotely angered her. So judging by that, I think if you believe in this kind of thing, someone has some serious apologizing to do. Because of this insane power, Egyptians were brought up to know that they had to stay on Sekhmet's good side, otherwise it would be risking the health and safety of themselves and those around them. So this is a PSA to whoever made Sekhmet so mad. Please go apologize. Buy her some flowers, make a sacrifice or two if you have to. Please just make her stop. It's literally my birthday today and all I want to do is live out my 20s in peace. Please, just do it for me. i right, number five. Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home sense signs your mom hangs up in her kitchen, then there's going to be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had, and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of Tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who as we know had over 100 kids. So the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far we've only confirmed 6, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number 3, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries, but like how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon, 
That would be the rule of Amenhotep the third. Amenhotep the fourth is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chillin' in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. Alright, so the Cambyses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus I and the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Astidius, by whom he became the father of Cyrus II. Cambius II, aka Cyrus II, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambyus's reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambyus was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there, and then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes I, or the Great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the battle of Salamis which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt, it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes life. After his reversal in Greece, he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues, in which he was in fact only a pawn. Thus, he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, Artaxerxes I, succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes I was given the throne by by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though, cause Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arda about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dossi Dossier from the Second Kingdom Egypt's Third Dynasty, he undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat-topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six-stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little
Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years. However, he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first obviously and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? Nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital, and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the sixth dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the Pyramid of Menkure is one of three pyramids of Giza alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafaskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menak who was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stone working. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genitals, the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in serious engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt, as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard. He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto 
maniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he had been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed, and then punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime. Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long, and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time, the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about, and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way. Controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off, and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rhinocola, or Rhinocolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten. And then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town's cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working, and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socioeconomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage, and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he'd forced his subjects to create. Kicking off our list at number 10, afterlife servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them too. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power and this tradition underwent a change, but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the 
last Greek ruler of Egypt, and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas. But there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees and then shake that box around to disturb said bees. And voila, now we have a very weak massager. There's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box, and sure, you can use your imagination to some degree, probably, yes. This invention, this scandalous idea, we're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt, because, you know, all the bees. Also, to put a box of bees anywhere near your box of bees, you know what I mean? Bravo, that's brave. If she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees, then double bravo, that's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around, let alone a box of them. No, thank you. Number seven, shaved eyebrows. <gasps> Ah, close one. I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point. That was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats are spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid, but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit. You know what I mean? Shave them off. Show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics, and two, it's gonna hurt, and the list goes on and on. It's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive but still quite extremely important back then that was seen quite a bit during these times was the use of stitches. Yeah, probably need some at some point. Building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egypt Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck. Don't move too quick. Number five, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack? Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood! Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood! The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know, like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself, do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then, one mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas, and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless. 
everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, then you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaved, shaved my head, lots of baths. It's just, it's, it's no fun, man. I'm too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one, Wario breath. Wow, okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints in mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, Eh, maybe I put in two. When I asked for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease, and they were kinda right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9, Djoser. So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the Limestone Step Pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8, Amenhotep III. Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself, is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7, Hatshepsut. Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6, Thutmose III. Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number seven, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which, Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose the Third of France? Either way, Thutmose the Third. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior, and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Five kitty love. We all know that the Egyptians loved cats. Why? 
I don't know. I honestly can't see why you would worship those angry little fur devils, but hey, to each their own, I guess. The Egyptians even had their own goddess for cats called Bastet, and though you might think that she was just some crazy cat lady goddess, you would be very, very wrong. Bastet had a dark side to her and was known as the Lady of Dread or the Lady of Slaughter, kind of fitting for a name for a cat goddess since they are also evil to their core. She was known to kill other gods like the god Apophis, whom she slaughtered by cutting off his head. Regardless of her dark past though, the Egyptians still worshipped her and many even worshipped her by bringing her offerings of mummified cats to her temple. Cats bring out the darkness in people, I'm telling you. At number 4, Boozy Blood. Sometimes we make bad decisions when we're emotional. Like those times that people punch walls when they're really mad and totally regret it afterwards. Well, even though they were deities, sometimes the Egyptian gods would do some regrettable things too. Ra the sun god had a mighty temper and was known to make some pretty rash decisions. At one point, Ra decided that he wanted everyone to just die, and so he instructed his daughter Hathor to slaughter all the humans that she could find. Hathor was totally on the same page and was like, okay, bet, and went off to kill some humans. Luckily for humanity though, Ra came to his senses and had a change of heart, but by the time he caught up to Hathor, she became so bloodthirsty that there was no stopping her. So in an attempt to trick her into stopping her killing conquest, Ra filled 7,000 jars with beer and gave it to Hathor, who then became so drunk that she just gave up on her mission and decided not to kill everyone. Now they say that alcohol can't solve all your problems, but in this case it certainly did. At number 3, creation. There are so many creation stories out there created by various religions and civilizations. One of the more bizarre creation stories however belongs to the ancient Egyptians because their first god did something a little weird to create life as we know it. These ancient people believed that their very first god Atum created himself and as such he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with and so to create his children and thus create humanity he pumped the hose and released humanity if you get what I'm saying here. If not, not, you're too young to be here. Anyways, out of his pleasurable process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. This legend also created the term the god's hand and was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. But yeah, I guess you could say that Atum was very pleased with what he created. At number two, giant snake. There were a lot of strange animals in Egyptian mythology, one of them being a giant snake. The Egyptian god Apep was a giant snake who had some serious snake beef with their son god Ra. They were polar opposites, Ra being the light, literally, and Apep representing darkness, chaos, and evil. One day, Apep just seemed to have had enough with Ra and all of his sunshine goodness and positive vibes and just swallowed him up. He gobbled up Ra and the sun, leaving the world in complete darkness. Luckily, the other gods were there to save the day and they had to slice Apep's belly open to free Ra and restore light to the world. This evil danger noodle lost this battle, but at least he got a taste of that spicy meatball in the sky. And finally, at number one, a hearty meal. There are two sides to every person. Some people are nice on the surface, but they have a dark core that they keep hidden from the world. And the same could sort of be said for the Egyptian god Khonsu. You see, the gods were seen as helpful, but people also feared them, for good reason. I mean, these guys could pack a punch, and Khonsu was one of those guys with a serious dark side. Khonsu was the god of the moon, and was also seen as the god of healing. Sounds super positive and all, however, he was also known to eat people's hearts. Yeah, human hearts were a choice snack of his, but he was also known to dine on the hearts of select gods as well. He definitely isn't the guy to mess with because you might become his next hearty meal.